Um, I want to introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, Sean Ellis. I'm really excited to have him here. He's been responsible for uh, helping, I guess, at least two startup companies go from launch to IPO, heading up uh, marketing. And uh, I think he's got some inter an interesting announcement on what he's, what he's doing now. But um, I'm going to hand it over to Sean. So uh, it's good to be here with Lean LA. I actually um, grew up in Southern California, and this is my first time ever professionally speaking in, in Southern California with a, with a group of uh, other startup people. So it's nice to finally be home and, and sort of, I actually am from Orange County, so I, so it's a little bit away, but. Um, so I, uh, just some quick background. Uh, Pete mentioned that I, I ran marketing at a couple of companies from launch through um, IPO filings. The last one was Log Me In that went out last summer. And before that, another company called Uproar.com, which was a, uh, a game company that uh, went public in 2000 and, and sold to the Universal in 2001. And um, basically, for the last couple of years, I have just kind of done everything that I wished I could have time to do when I was in these previous companies, but you're too busy executing to, to sort of figure out the way that you should be executing. And so really for the last two years, I, I had the opportunity to work alongside, that's was, that was the first marketing person at Dropbox, that was the first marketing person at Zobni, um, Eventbrite, a bunch of companies where I could kind of come in before they had marketing people, work alongside the, the CEOs, and, and just kind of figure out the way that it's supposed to be done, read everything I could get my hands on, and basically came to a lot of the same conclusions that people talk about with, with lean startups, but um, I didn't really call them lean at the time. It's just as I started writing my blog and publishing these things, people said, oh, you're another lean startup guy. And so I, I now I'm a lean startup guy too. Um, but uh, really funny thing is that I, I feel like I, I really, got a, a good view on how to build a successful kind of normal startup, traditional startup, and uh, I, over the last few weeks, have decided to pull the trigger on founding a new startup that requires a completely different approach that's going to be a network effect startup, and so it's kind of kind of sucks that I <laughs> spent all the time learning how to do it, and then, then when I pull the trigger on my own startup, it's going to be a completely different type of startup, but I've done a lot of thinking on that, and I've trying to find useful information on taking a, a network effect type startup, and I'll, I'll explain what that is um, in, in a few slides, but um, I, I really haven't found very much useful information, and so hopefully this will be, this will be it's, it's definitely, a lot of this stuff will be debatable, and, and hopefully we can have some, some good conversations around it and involve it a bit, but um, the, uh, so the general purpose or objective of today is, is to go through share a lot of the same things that I've, that I've been talking about for the last couple of years on really a normal startup and how you take that to market and then go into the details on the network effect startup and, um, and then try to refine some of that based on the feedback. So Pete covered a little bit of what a lean startup is, but I just, there's, there's a lot of different principles that are floating around out there and um, so I just listed some of these and then if I miss one, feel free to shout it out. But there's, there's a concept that's been around for a long time that's not necessarily associated with lean, but it's just the idea of nail it and then scale it. So really get, get the formula right for the startup before you try to scale it, that scaling a company is really distracting. And if you're trying to figure out everything on the fly while trying to grow it, um, it's, it's really hard to be successful. But that's, that's kind of the essence of what a lean startup is all about. Um, kind of in more details. So a lot of the, the, the principles behind a lean startup um, come out of uh, Steve Blank's customer development. Has anybody read Four Steps to the Epiphany? Okay, that's, if you haven't read it, it's, it's by far the best book that I've ever read on, on uh, de-risking a startup and, and making a startup successful, so I highly recommend it. Uh, the, the, the big part of it, so a lot of it came out of customer development on one side, which is uh, Steve Blank, and then Eric Reese covered a lot of things from sort of the, the CTO perspective of agile development and rapid iteration, a lot of other things, and you, you kind of take all of that together, and that's that's a lot of what Steve Lean Startup's all about, but the customer development side is really about hypothesis testing. It's about admitting that when you have a vision for the startup, when you come out to, to create a startup, you need, it, it's based on a lot of assumptions on, on what's going on out there, 
And the idea is that you want to document those assumptions as, as best as you can, and then go through and try to validate those assumptions. Because if you find out that something's not actually true, if, if a problem doesn't exist that you think exists, and that's what your whole startup is based on, it's a lot cheaper to go out and find that out by asking the people who you think have that problem than to spend all this time developing the product, launch it, try to grow it, and then find out that that problem actually doesn't exist or isn't important enough to try to solve. So that's the idea of just writing down as much as you can about market, pricing, customer needs, and then, and then going through and trying to validate those. Uh, MVP is a big part of, of, kind of the lean startup. It's, it's, a, it's a term that comes up a lot, which is just minimum viable product. So anyone who's tried to create a product based on a vision um, knows the slippery slope of basically you, you start out with uh, a fairly narrowly defined vision, and then over time, everyone's got another idea of how it can be better. And before long, you've got something that's going to take three years to create. And so the idea here is. To, to really narrow it down, like what is the, the minimum product that can actually satisfy that need that you think is out there, and, and start with that, and then, and then kind of have versions that go beyond there. Uh, low burn by design is a big part of Lean Startup. So there's a lot of conversations about is Lean cheap, or is Lean something else? And, and usually the people who say, no, it's not cheap, say it's about learning and speed. But ultimately, it is about not wasting money, and um, and that's that's both of those things. You want to be careful with money. You want to learn. You want to move quickly, and you don't want to have a bunch of waste. And so it may not the, the core principle may not be cheap, but the the, the process of, a, of building a lean startup is one that that you're not wasting a lot of money generally. Um, and then uh, and then finally, metrics, iteration, and agile development are other concepts that are often tied into the lean startup. Uh, learn fast, fail fast. So I just mentioned learning is a really important part of it. Is there anything else that someone feels like I'm missing on the lean startup principles? Again, like I haven't really studied it that much. It's just, <laughs> it's just I get grouped in there. So there's probably someone in here that knows more about lean than than I do. Um, so my my original experience, I, we, we talked about. I had these two companies that I ran marketing at from from the beginning through IPO filings and. Uh, when I went into, the, the, both the companies were started in, in Budapest, Hungary, and the uh, first one in uh, 1995. And so I didn't have any marketing background, but fortunately the, the, the country was communist a few years before, so doing not very many people have marketing backgrounds, so I was able to get an opportunity. <laughs> Here it would be a lot harder with no marketing background. Um, so I, I was able to, to not just sort of say, what does a marketer do and how do I do all of those things? But instead, I put my money into these companies, made angel investments in them, and I was, I was really trying to just figure out how to make them successful. So I didn't, I didn't try to look at things through a marketer's lens. Instead, I just tried to say, how, how can I figure out how to grow these businesses and what's important? So the first one, we had a, a narrowly defined set of goals. Uh, one was we wanted to lead the online game category to the biggest company in that space. Uh, the second was get users at a cost lower than the value of those users. Seems obvious, but in the uh, mid to late 90s, it was not that obvious. People just you know, spend on commercials and other things, and hopefully it all work out. Uh, and then minimize waste by using really good metrics and trying to understand where we're we wasting money and how, how can we funnel that money toward um, toward good opportunities. So this company did end up becoming the number one game company in the world at the time. And uh, we actually had the lowest customer acquisition cost of any um, public company out there for a free registered user. So it, it wasn't that hard to do relative to everyone else being kind of crazy how they were spending money. But, um, but ultimately, this lean approach, even at a time where people were spending irrationally, helped us to lead the category and build a, build a pretty successful company. Um, the, the second startup was Log Me In, and we used a lot of the same principles, same same founding team at, at Log Me In, and we used a lot of the same principles, but um, added a couple things. One was in, in the first company, I was much more focused on uh, just A/B testing. Everything was A/B testing. The second company, I, I tried to actually figure out why people responded a certain way, what what were they valuing within the product, and, and just try to dig in a lot more on that. We also got a lot better at, at optimizing the funnel and really trying to figure out how do we how do we take all friction out of the customer acquisition process. So, just if you think about this, these very narrowly defined set of goals helped us build two companies that that did public listings. And so, you could list all the things that marketers could could possibly do, 
but it turned out that these were the important ones. And so I think that's, that's a big part of just really figuring out what are the things that matter and how do you execute really well on those. And over time, those things start to evolve and change. So you need to sort of figure out what's important at any given point in the development of your business. Uh, so I mentioned that I want to compare normal startups, which is what I spent most of my last couple of years focusing on, trying to figure out how do you create a, a successful normal startup, and then network effect startup, which is the company that I'm founding is going to be a network effect startup. So I've done a ton of thinking about it recently. I haven't been able to find anything really useful that's written on it, so I figured that I might as well write about it and talk about it and force myself to try to figure it out in a way where I won't be too embarrassed about what I'm saying. Uh, so hopefully, again, when I, by putting it out there, we can we can talk through it. Um, does anybody actually have a network effect business that they're working on? Yeah. All right, cool. So we've got some, some people in here. So I was a little bit worried that I'd be the only one interested in the topic. Um, but I'm going to start by looking at a normal startup, and um, it's way easier in a normal startup. There's it's just a lot more. It's, it's a much more controlled environment for building a company, and so. Thank yourself that you're focused on a normal startup if you're not in a network effect. Uh, the, the general thing is that ultimately you, you have to create something of value, and that's, that's goal number one. If you can't create something of value, then you're, everything else doesn't really matter. And, um, and, and by value, it's value for the users. I'll go into more details on this. Once you create something of value, then you need to get efficient about being able to acquire users, monetize users highlight the right things about the product, a lot of things that ultimately will make it a lot easier to grow. Once you have those two things, then you can think about growing. And it's not going to be easy, but it'll be a lot easier. It would have been nearly impossible if you didn't have the other pieces before. Uh, so creating value, I think in, in all kinds of startups, that is first and foremost the most important goal that you should be focused on. And, and a, one that's surprisingly, people get so busy tweaking business models and other things that they, they forget about. Ultimately, if you don't create something that's useful for people, uh, you, you'll fail. So product market fit is, is basically about creating a product that is a must have, creates good value for people, and hopefully people that represent a reasonable size market so that you, you have something to grow into. Uh, so how do you become a must have product? Uh, these, again, First thing you do is you read Steve Blank's Four Steps to the Epiphany. There's, a, there's sort of the Cliff Notes version that's on uh, cusdev.com. Brings some, some other thinking in there as well. A really, really good uh, ebook that was that came out pretty recently. Um, and but the, really the thing that you want to start with, as I talked about, is write down those assumptions and and really set out every assumption and every risk within the business. And before the first line of code is written, go out and actually validate that which assumptions are true, which are not true, and, and really make sure that you are, um, that you are basing your vision on, on facts. Um, you want to get a, a release out to users as quickly as possible. So even, even when you go through and you validate everything through interviews, you may not have created something of value. You really don't know until you put it in their hands and you ask them, OK, if, if you couldn't use this, would you be bummed, or, or does it not really matter? So the, you're hoping that they would be very disappointed if they couldn't use it. Take it through a survey that I have on that. Once you, once you understand that there's enough people that would be very disappointed without it, you want to figure out what are the must-have use cases and, and users. So who considers it a must-have? Why do they consider it a must-have? That's going to be really critical information. You want, to, you want to gather these facts outside of the building. This is you know, going out, talking to people in person, phone calls, and ultimately sort of narrowing down your, your views on things through surveys. And it, you may find out that you haven't created something of value, and that's where you need to pivot the business. Uh, so survey.io is a, a survey that is available for free that I, I put out with Kissmetrics that literally you can, it takes you about two minutes to customize it, embed it on your site, or email it out to your users and really find the answers to if, if people consider your product a must have. And it, there's one key question on there. There's about eight questions on the survey, but the critical one is just asking them how would they feel if they could no longer use the product. If they say that they'd be somewhat disappointed without your product, then you've created a nice to have, and it's going to be hard to build a successful business on a nice to have. But if you if you have enough people, and, and where I found that there's really a, uh, kind of a benchmark around 40%, that um, if, you, if you have uh, enough people around 40% that, that consider your product something they'd be very disappointed without, 
you have what you need to feel confident about moving forward and, and focusing on getting a business that will be growable. And um, if you're if you're really low on that number, you probably are in a place where you're going to need to pivot and actually really control costs and, and start to think about a, a very different direction for the product. If you're somewhere in between, you might be able to get there just by repositioning and, and highlighting different features within the product. But this, uh, I have a uh, blog post that, that you can link to from uh, startupmarketing.com that basically says using survey.io that gives the details on, on how, to, how to do this a little bit better. Um, but once you have enough people who say they'd be very bit disappointed without your product, part of the reason why I quantify it there, by the way, is that the roller coaster ride of being a, a startup founder is, you know, one day you're looking at the exact same information and the world's coming to an end. The next day you're looking at it and, and you're you couldn't possibly fail with this thing and you have to kind of take that that lens off where it's subjective in making that decision and have some sort of concrete metric that you're working toward. And so another one you might find is it's just, you know, what's what's my 30-day actives? They have something that, that essentially takes the emotion out of, of making that decision. Once you hit that, you, you shift into a very different mode in trying to grow the business. So this is really a race to get to the point where you can scale the business. A big part of that is because value, customer perceived value, is is perishable. People who today are saying that they'd be very disappointed without your product. As soon as they find a viable alternative to your product, it changes to somewhat disappointed. They, they, well, I wouldn't be that disappointed. I would just switch to that product. And so now, when you're back to a, a somewhat disappointed product, you're you're going to have a hard time creating a successful business. So that's why once you hit that, you really need to to move on quickly to being able to try to grow that business. So um, focus on speed rather than short-term burn. Um, the interesting thing is one of the companies that I worked with. As soon as, we, as soon as we had a product that we were ready to scale, we went through and did a lot of things in this growth transition period, got through it, hit the gas pedal to scale the business, raised $10 million right before we hit the gas pedal, and it went cash flow positive the next month and stayed cash flow positive. So if we had been conservative, taken a year to get there and really try to control costs, we'd have been a lot longer until we got to a cash flow positive uh, situation. So this is really the only time in, in the company where it's not that big of a deal if you can get through it quickly. And so that's it's a big cultural shift because you may have needed to be patient for a really long time before you uh, reach product market fit and you're talking to VCs and they're saying, oh, it's great, you're really controlling your burn. And then suddenly, if you don't set the expectations up front that speed is more important than burn because we've, we have created a product and our goal is to scale this thing as quickly as possible, we're doing these things to be able to start scaling it. Um, if you Try to tell that after the fact. They'll think that you're kind of telling some revisionist history on things. So it's much better to set the expectations up front. Um, so what are some of the, the key projects that you need to, to get your company in place to be able to grow? So the first one is understanding those users who say they would be very disappointed without your product. Why, why would they be very disappointed? Who are they? Really trying to just hone in on what that core value is. It's, it's a lot of surveying and narrowing down and just peeling back the onion, but, but trying to find that what is that one very differentiated important benefit in the business that's, that's really going to be the foundation of, of everything that you do, that you're really going to try to orient around that. Um, first part in orienting around that is positioning. And so you're going to want to figure out a promise that represents the hardest thing as we just talked about to create is a must-have product. And so that, that experience that's must have is, is the one part that you don't want to lose. And so at that point, you want to build positioning that represents that. It sets expectations as people are coming into the site and it creates desire for that experience that you know you're good at delivering. And you, you want to do, so you, you don't want to just A-B test like crazy for a response that happens to be something different that doesn't represent that experience because people are going to come in and, and and have different expectations and not, not be anticipating the experience that's a must have. So you want to be very defined around what that experience is and then A-B test around the hooks that bring people in to wanting that experience. So how do you set a context that makes people receptive to that promise? How do you A-B test a description that still represents that promise? But the one place that you don't want to A-B test away from is that promise. You need to, you need to be true to that promise because that's that's the big value that you've created as a business. I, 
I haven't really gone into those details in the past before because that was a lot of, all of these things are what I did with my consulting business to help people get through here quickly, but I'm doing something else that's it's, it's a free for all. Um, the, the metrics are, a, uh, are another really important part at this, at this point. Like before, metrics weren't that important, but now that you are going to try to grow the business, you want to do it as efficiently as possible. So now's the time to really obsess about making sure that you're measuring all the right things and, and getting those metrics in place. Uh, this is also when you want to optimize and, and really, uh, both the landing pages and the funnel, but just, just really try to find the most efficient on-ramping process, that, that first user experience that draws people into the must-have experience. And finally, you want to make sure that you have good economics in the business that, that allow you to um, spend a reasonable amount to acquire users and not lose money. And you also want to think through the growth strategy and, and how you're going to try to grow that business. So landing pages, unfortunately, when you start to test them, you're going to see the numbers improve quickly, and, and you're going to want to go back to that well forever. But unfortunately, it flattens out eventually. As it flattens out, then you know you're done. Um, the, the funnel, Kissmetrics has uh, taken, this is a funnel that I used to create um, with companies, and it would take them a few months to develop it. Kissmetrics basically has it to a point where they can, they can essentially get a company up and running within a day or two on this funnel. I'm an advisor there, so I, I'll put that out there, but it's, it's really, the reason I'm an advisor there is because it was such a bottleneck when I worked with companies that I wanted somebody to, to create something that would be useful. And the um, whole idea of getting through this transition period is to improve your conversion efficiency and your average revenue per user. When you have those two things in place, you can grow the business much more effectively. I've tried to grow businesses without this, and it's you're, you're probably going to be able to get about a tenth of the growth. If you can get 100 people a day after doing these things, you'll be able to get 1,000 people a day on the same channel. So it's, it makes a big difference. And, and even if the numbers aren't quite the same, maybe it's 200 instead of 100, but it's, it basically means a lot better ROI on the dollars that you're spending. And so it's really critical to Get through this quickly, but do it right and don't skip over it. So once you have those pieces in place, then you're in a lot better position to grow the business. Um, big thing that you want to do when you start thinking about the channels to grow the business is you want to think about scalability. So you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to make something work that is potentially only going to add 20 or 30 people a day. Um, you also want to think about ease of implementation. If, if something is very scalable, very easy to implement, and free. And it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed that it's going to work, but if, if it scores pretty well in each of those, that's probably something that you should be trying first. And what you want to do is not shut people down when they, when they say, uh, oh, just stay out of it. I'll figure out how to grow the business. You, you actually want to kind of motivate the whole team to, to give ideas and then just sort of plot those ideas on the priority of testing and rank them on each of those things and the things that are they're easy, scalable, and cheap, do first, and then you just hope that you don't run out of things to, to keep testing. So eventually you'll be bummed. Sorry? Right? It's organic. Uh, organic basically means that it may be scalable, but you, you can't just throw money at it and scale it overnight. It's, it's something that kind of takes time to kick in. Um, just real quick on, on kind of the process is that, you, you know, your daily process is to come in and just monitor conversions, know what the, the important numbers are in the business, make sure that nothing's broken, then optimize campaigns. So kind of the same idea of the landing pages and the funnel, you want to do that on each campaign and, um, and, and make sure that they're really working at peak performance. Scale the positive ROI campaigns as much as you can. And then that's like the first five minutes of every day. And then the rest of the day is basically testing new sources and coming up with, with more things to test. So, yep. What would you say in terms of allocating money towards testing versus things that are already working, but perhaps producing a lower margin than what you'd really like to be seeing? Uh, really what I'm trying to do is, is maximize the amount of money that I'm spending on, on anything that gives me a positive return on investment. And, um, and obviously, I'm not going to put it into something that's a little return on investment if there's something else that hasn't been fully scaled that's a really big return on investment. But if you what I found is that if you don't have enough money to fund all of those positive ROI opportunities, it's a perfect time to go out and raise money because that's the easiest money to raise ever. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't run into that problem very often. It's, 
it's usually much more about I have a lot of money and, and no place to spend it. Effect, or rationally, anyway. It's really easy to spend money irrationally. Uh, so now I'm going to look at the, the, the network effect businesses. And then, and then when we get to Q&A, we can, we can kind of dig into, uh, into the normal businesses more if you want to. But the network effect businesses, yeah, like I said, it's going to be a little bit rough. I've studied a lot of different businesses out there to try to figure this out. And um, it should be an interesting conversation around it. The big difference is that value, that's, that's the thing that you're trying to get right before you grow a normal business, you actually have to grow to get value in a network effect business, and it, it makes it a lot harder. So, um, you know, the kind of when you hear about lean startups, a lot of times it's contrasted against, oh, the stupid thing they did back in the late 90s was get big fast. So lean startup is the opposite of that. So get big fast is kind of what you have to do to validate this. So it's a, it's, it, it makes it a little bit more challenging. I think I've found a way around some of those challenges. So that's, the, uh, that's what we'll go into. So part of it is in the preparation before you even do anything in the business. Um, what are the things that you can do to de-risk it? So I've already talked about customer development. But for a network effect business, this is where you probably want to do twice as much customer development than you would have done in a, in a, in, in a normal business. Because you can't sort of incrementally test little things and scale. Like it, essentially, once you think you have it right, you really have to go for it. So, so you really have to vet all of your assumptions through customer development up front. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is again kind of the opposite of what you think of for lean a lot of times, is you don't want to raise, I, I've studied some of the, the network effect businesses that have gone out of business. And um, a lot of times, that they're, they're kind of almost there, but, but basically, they're, they were so worried about dilution that they they raised enough where they thought, oh, once we prove this out, we'll raise and we'll get a really good valuation. But um, if you really have to raise enough to get to the other side, otherwise you haven't de-risked anything, and all you've kind of done is, is kind of gotten to a place where it's really hard to raise more money. So I, I really think that if, if you're going to raise with, uh, with a smaller amount of money, just make sure that you, you have to be even more careful about how you spend as much of that on customer acquisition as you can. And so like when I think about the business that I'm starting, uh, I have sort of, if we take the seed path, we're going we're gonna to do our development in Ukraine. If we, take, if, we're, if we raise a full Series A, we're going to use Pivotal Labs. And we'll, it'll be probably four times as much money, but we know it'll be super scalable. Because I know if I can vet out the economics and, and get the business in a place where it can, where basically it's not scalable, the wheels are falling off because the technology is not there, but all the numbers are vetted and I've got lots of people, that's a much better position to be in to try to raise money. So let's just be careful about kind of raising just enough to get halfway through no man's land. Um, and then this is kind of a new concept playing on the minimum viable product. Sort of the minimum viable critical mass and sort of thinking about get big fast overall, or get big fast within a narrowly defined market and being able to validate. Because it's really critical mass is what's needed to be able to validate that you have created value. And so if you can get to that critical mass within a smaller market and, and demonstrate that you have created value in that, then you can start to jump and go into that. And part of that is, is studying companies like Facebook that started with, with um, Harvard and then rolled out to other Ivy League schools and basically they, they kind of dominated each thing but rolled out uh, Twitter. I just read the case study on this pretty recently. It was really interesting. Somebody in the past had told me that Twitter was successful because they blew up PR. But uh, what the, the case study that I read on it was that Twitter was successful because they they basically at South by Southwest gave got, got a handful of influencers on Twitter accounts, sitting in events, and then by the registration desk, they put these massive screen televisions that people were signing up and looking up at the board and seeing these live tweets coming by about sessions that were live right at that point. And so they were able to kind of get the audience side and the content creator side and created enough interest there that that's where the press kind of piece kicked in. But you can see, so they got critical mass at South by Southwest in this really defined area. So sort of thinking through, like, is it, is it a region? Is it a demographic? Is it a product type? I have one company that I've been working with that basically says, 
we have to go completely big. And they made a really good case for it that, um, sorry, just in the last, in the last month or two, I've, I've started to get a lot more involved with network effect businesses to try to help them figure it out and, and to be able to look over their shoulder as they figure it out. Uh, but that's, that's it. what I found with them is that their minimum viable critical mass is actually a huge market, so it's a bit risky, but they, they seem to be figuring it out. Um, but whatever it is, I think it's, you're, you're trying to kind of get the narrowest market that you can. And then you also want to have a, a strategy for priming the pump, um, particularly, you know, or, or get the flywheel moving, or I mean, that's, it seems like half the VC meetings that I go into are talking about priming the pump, the other half are talking about the flywheel, but just basically how do you get traction, how do you get the ball rolling? Uh, so that's, that's the prep work. So that's before you've really done anything to try to grow the business. These are all things that you can really think through and try to be as solid as possible, and then go and try to grow the business. And so that's where it really gets tough. If you think about the pyramid where where on the pyramid, you've got the growth transition period after you get the product right, then you start scaling. This, you're actually doing all of them at the same time. So you, you have to scale and optimize at, at, the, at the exact same time. So um, what you're trying to do is you've got your narrowly defined minimum viable uh, critical mass, and you're trying to scale in there and get enough to be able to see if the value is good. You have to generate revenue early. So a lot of times I, I talk about with um, companies that are on um, traditional businesses that it's probably better not to have a revenue model in, when you're trying to get to product market fit because you, you basically block a lot of people from coming in and experiencing the product and if they say they wouldn't be very disappointed without it when it's a free product then you know the answer that they're not going to be very disappointed without it on paying. So that it's, But here you see from day one I'm saying you should have revenue because you have to scale and I think it's crazy to try to scale without revenue, so that's, that's why I have revenue here early. Um, and then you're basically doing a lot of the same things as before, but you're, you're engaging users right from the beginning, and you're, you're looking for lights of validation and, and doing like live repositioning on, on, as you start to see pockets of value, you're trying, to, you're trying to reposition things there. You're doing lots of iteration and optimizing but it's, it's basically, as people are coming through, you just a lot more moving parts that you have to get right. And, um, and then ultimately, you need to go back and engage people, whether it's through survey.io or through interviews. But ultimately, once you get to that, what you believe is minimum viable critical mass, you need to um, validate that you actually have been able to gratify those people. And then if you have, then you can start to replicate that approach. Like, again, if you think about Facebook, being able to basically just roll out to, eventually they went mainstream, but they, they went universities and then eventually to Silicon Valley companies, but they, they sort of limited access. Quora's been doing something pretty similar. LinkedIn did something pretty similar where they know that if they just open it up to everybody, that the, the noise to sort of important information ratio will be so low that they, or so high that they um, aren't going to be able to keep it. The, the important people on there. So they, they, it's, it's a great place when you get in on Quora to be able to interact with people that are very hard to reach otherwise. Um, so priming the pump, uh, one of the things that you might need to do is uh, create network balance. So when I think about um, network balance, I did find a, a Harvard Business Review study on, on this for network effect businesses where they essentially say you have to subsidize half of the equation. So. You can imagine, like for eBay, eBay was profitable from day one, so that's a, that's a hard one to figure out. But if, if you kind of thought that you've got all these sellers, but you don't have enough buyers, you might need to pay twice as much as a seller's worth to acquire them and kind of build them up to, until you kind of get that balance going. Um, dating sites, same sort of thing. It's all males and no females, so maybe you buy the females at a loss to, to, to balance things out. Um, Aardvark has a, has a kind of an interesting case study where they, they basically had people would ask questions and they pretend it was automated and just answering them themselves. You can you could kind of build in services to do some of those things. Um, but, but basically, you can fake it until, until to, because otherwise, if, if somebody's trying to find someone on the other side of the equation and they're not there, then you lose them too. So don't, don't worry too much about profitable interactions early on. You just need to prime the pump to make sure that you get enough critical mass on both sides, and hopefully you've defined it narrowly enough so that if, like, if you were in the eBay case, that you you've defined it to just a 
or at least you know maybe it's just art or maybe it's you know something that's that, that you don't have to try to subsidize every category at the same time. But again, eBay is a hard one to figure out because they were profitable from day one. Um, so what's what's interesting if you kind of think about the way that the uh, the way that the uh, pyramid looked on normal businesses, it's almost inverted on this. That you're you're basically driving growth, you're getting efficient conversions, and then finally you're you're going up to to product market fit and repositioning on value. And once you get those things figured out, then then you're off to the races. I, well, part of the reason why I did, I wanted to launch a network effect type business one was because I saw a need that that looked like it was unfulfilled and I was in a good position to fill that need. But the other piece is that I think it's all really hard work in the beginning. But if you figure it out, like when you kind of look at what the, the, when the dot-com bubble burst, eBay was one of the few companies that just didn't miss a beat on revenue and growth. And um, so I think it, it's probably one really hard year of work. And then afterwards, if you, if you leave the space and it gets rolling, then you're in good shape. So for me, that's, that's the way I like to do it. I, I know four or five years of toil scares the hell out of me. Um, but again, remember that, that like a startup, um, the normal startup pyramid is for most businesses. So just kind of figure out which side you're on and, and kind of follow the approach. But that's it. Does anybody have uh, comments or thoughts? A couple questions. You mentioned uh, customer acquisitions, and I was wondering how you calculate the cost on that. The other one was survey I.O. I mean, who do you send that to? How do you get participation in that? So, I mean, one, you, you, the survey.io is really meant for people who've experienced your product. So I'll start with that, and then we'll work that to the other one. Um, the, uh, so either you could do an embed in your site. What I found is that an embed in the site tends to have higher results. So you probably need to adjust a little bit. You probably want like a 50% for an embed versus an email. Is, uh, it works as well. So if you're collecting email. But the, the main thing is you want to try to get people who have been on the site fairly recently, which you'll always get on an embed. And ideally, you want to get people who've come in and experienced the, the kind of what you think is the core of the product. So people who just hit the site and bounced off are, are not going to give you much useful information. But I mean, the main thing to think about is that you, you're going to have a very inefficient conversion process early on. And I'm encouraging you not to try to deal with that early on. You, you should, even if it's inefficient, you'll still get some people that will make it to the finish line. And I mean, you, there's no reason to have it purposely be bad, but just you don't want to spend a lot of time iterating and wasting sort of development resources on iterating the funnel when you could be iterating the core product. And, but once you, once you get the core product right, then you definitely want to go back and, and iterate the funnel. Um, as far as figuring out uh, your, your acquisition cost per channel, um, you, ideally you want to have some sort of tracking where you can look at people who convert and you, you can track them back to that source. And then it's pretty easy that you can say, if I spent $100 on that source, and I got 10 people that converted from that source, it was $10 per person. Yeah. How do you deal with uh, in, this whole process? It's kind of like iterating backwards. And like some companies, they approach this stuff and they do like opportunity identification, and they like check out the industry structure and blah, blah, blah. How do you approach that with this network effect and the lean startup when you have an industry structure that most people aren't really paying attention to because he doesn't talk about that in four steps of that getting in your way because that could really jam you up big time if you don't. Really so are you are you referring to like a more established business that you would be doing? No, this no, thing? no. Like like any of these, like any anything that's like tech related where somebody's iterating to try to find that fit, but they're not really aware of the industry structure of how that is going to impact. Yeah, I'm not sense. sure I, I, I understand. Like there's that. an environment, like your environment, the industry and your environment. All these factors, buyer supplier power, you know, threat of new entrants, substitutes, all those things are going to impact your model. So if you're like out there iterating and you're not paying attention to like, oh, hey, there's like somebody out there with like 60% market share out there. I'm iterating away. I'm dumping money, funneling it in there. I, I got a great fit, uh -huh. but I got this lurking. Are you talking about for a network effect business or, or a either business? One. I yeah, think I for the normal business, I would basically say forget about competitors. Like once you, like if you talk to a bunch of people when you're doing the customer development and they keep saying, oh, I don't really need that because X does the same thing, then competitors are basically telling you that it's, it's not an unmet need. 
But if they don't know about the competitors, then it really doesn't matter that they exist. What kills most startups is, is just the irrelevancy of their of their solution in the first place. That the solution doesn't doesn't actually create meaningful value for people. And to me, that it's not. I, I seldom see like if you're doing it on a really micro level, like it's a hundred users who come in and experience it. And how many of those hundred users say, "Wow, that was that was awesome. I really want that thing." And it, and that's that's sort of irrelevant of what the what the broader industry is all about. Does that does that make sense, or do you disagree with that? Or? I'm just trying to find a way of how you balance that because I, I see him pushing people out there to get out there behind the desk and do all the iterating and stuff like that, but I'm not hearing enough of paying attention to the environment, and that's what that's what kills the startups is they're not paying attention to the environment because that's what that's why they're not getting the conversions. They're they're predicating that on if somebody isn't aware of it, that doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to the competitors. It means that group of people you surveyed just happens to not be familiar with them because the competitors haven't hit them. Mm -hmm. So I'd want to know why they're not. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think ultimately that there's no one-size-fits-all formula, all of this, but the, um, the, there are so many moving parts in a startup that if you try to cover everything, you, you'll definitely fail. If you can kind of narrow it down to a set of things that are manageable, that, you, that, that are, are within your control, then, then you have a fighting chance, but you probably still fail. <laughs> um, this, this goes to customer development. I think it might touch um, on what you're talking about in terms of trying to understand what the infrastructure is of a given industry, because I've gone through this with the startup I'm working on. Isn't that part of customer development is to understand not only who your individual competitors are, but the actual ecosystem of the industry, like the way what you know, what's the supply chain, you know, what's the way that the industry is really, you know, these companies really talk together? Because obviously every company's different. It's kind of yeah, micro I mean, and the macro. It sounds like like you're talking about business to business type opportunities more. Is that are you or? Um, you know, there's definitely a B two B element in it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's pure B two B though. So, so, I mean, the one thing that I would say is that, that the user perception is the most important part and that, that I mean, really my interpretation of what Four Steps to the Epiphany is saying, where I, where I learned a lot of really good things from that, is that basically don't figure out your sort of value delivery system until you figure out that you've actually created value in the first place. And that the, the value in the first place is what holds most people up. And if you sort of spread your resources between trying to figure out both of those at the same time, it's kind of the same thing as funnel optimization, but now it's just you know supply chain and, the, and optimization. But it, you know, ultimately, ultimately, you can start to do some of this validation on just a prototype of your product, like I, I mentioned, that um, that like Aardvark, they, they they kind of pretended some. They they gave people the experience where they could ultimately say, "Is that an experience that you would be very disappointed if you could no longer have?" And if the answer is yes, then all right, let's automate that experience. But if it's if the answer is like, I, I don't know why I would ever need that, then it's probably not worth spending a lot of cycles on optimizing the experience or automating. Yep. Um, one of the companies you mentioned, eBay, has a kind of a two-customer environment where they have their seller and their buyer. I think some startups have two-customer environments and they're trying to iterate. And so I was wondering what your advice might be on iterating in like a dual, a dual customer environment. Kind of where do you place your resources as far as like who you want to iterate with first and who, who, who kind of takes precedence over, um, over, their vo over the voice of maybe how they feel about a certain feature or a certain part. Maybe one part, one party might like that. Another, the other, other customer might not like those aspects. How do you, how do you go, how do you go about navigating a, those waters? So for me, I'm, I'm looking. Uh, my, my approach tends to be looking for um, pockets of positive instead of negative, because there's a lot of people who won't like things. But if enough people do like it and they represent a good enough market, then you can kind of double down on that versus. Like I, I just, I, I kind of just filter out all the negative noise and, and just really look for for the, the positive areas. But ultimately, if let's like, like let's take that forty percent for example, if the if forty percent overall say they'd be very disappointed without it, great. Then you then you have something of value created. But even if it's twenty percent, but when you narrow it down and you say, but the business people are like fifty two percent, so. Th 
you know, business people, there's enough of those. That, that's that's, that's a, a, a good opportunity. So as long as we define our market as that, we've got product market fit. Or, um, you know, if, it, if it's not, if it, maybe it's a specific use case. The people who are using it this way they consider it to be something that, that they can't live without. But ultimately, I think that the challenge tends to be in a, in a network effect type business with that, that, that the starting point is enough critical mass on both sides to basic, like if, if they're basically saying that they don't have value because it doesn't work this way, but they haven't fully tried it because there wasn't enough sellers on the other side, then I would say get the sellers before you start trying to adjust on those needs. Like get it up to that critical mass before you validate and change it. That, that's my interpretation anyway, yeah? Um, so do you have any experience with the freemium models and the free trials type of the marketing solution? I'm, I'm on my uh, 14th freemium company. Right? Uh, so so my main works. question is for how long does it make sense to clutch to this to this user who absolutely not willing to pay yet takes full advantage of let's say 30 or 60 day. So log, log me in, just did an IPO and, and they, I mean the numbers that were published in the S1 are, are something like, something in the 90s, 90 something percent of users pay nothing but it's a profitable company, it's generating lots of revenue. So to me, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a negative that some users don't pay. I think it's a positive that the companies, that the, the well-built company, and, and Skype just filed for an IPO, and 90-something percent of them don't pay. But I think that the, when I look at freemium, I look at it as it means that they've been able to build a business from the ground up that can be competitive and profitable and sustainable where 90-something percent of the users don't pay. Versus, oh, we've created, yeah, I, I see a lot of times when there's debates about freemium that somebody else will come back and say, why would I give it away for free to some people when they've got all these people that are just milking the system, I'm gonna be premium only, and that's, that's the world I'm gonna live in, and now you're vulnerable to the next guy who says, well, I'm gonna build a business from the ground up that can compete with our own free product, and we're just a lot more defensible. So I think ultimately, if there's a free alternative out there, and you're relying on that information not going out for a, that, that people aren't going to figure out that there's a free alternative to your paid only, that you're, you're not, that's, that's an environmental thing that you, you probably should be paying attention to. Yeah. So staying on the freemium uh, topic, when you're thinking about establishing the product market fit and you're, you're preparing to do the survey, how do you think about which population you survey? Do you survey the people that have been using the free version? You survey the people that have used the premium both, both separately. Both. Yeah. And how would you infer like drastically different results in terms of the very disappointed question? I think you need to get both sides up about forty percent. I um, what's really funny is that I see for a lot of companies the um, the free users are about forty percent and and then the paid users are, are lower and then a lot of other companies it's vice versa. So to me, I think you, you really have two products that you have to get right in that situation and, and that they need to sort of stand on their own. And if your free product builds enough users around it and you have a similar value proposition on your paid product, you have the perfect contextual environment for introducing the paid product and the benefits of that paid product to get people to upgrade. Yeah. What are your thoughts on strategy on a business that hits a critical mass and then plateaus or like reaches like a local maximum? Like Dig would probably be the most famous example where they have like a really sustainable base of 250k users but never really managed to take off after that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, that there's saturation worries in a lot. I mean, that's almost all of those businesses, there's kind of saturation worries. And you even see it, like if you look at Google Trends, it's, it's pretty interesting looking at Google Trend lines for like Facebook and MySpace and all these companies, they're and then they, they saturate the market that they're in. But I think Facebook's a prime example there that they didn't have very good monetization on the way up that curve. Once they saturated, they, they started to have great monetization and they, they understood that the asset is is having the the, the social, you know, the, just the whole social understanding of, of who's connected to who and what's what's happening there and being able to monetize a lot of different Tar advertising targeting preferences based on based on, on things like that and for me like I I think as a marketer I look at Facebook as a really good opportunity for growth within there and if they can start to somehow 
charge me to be able to, to navigate through there to acquire more users cost effectively? Like there, there's just a lot of different angles. I don't know about Dig in particular, but I think ultimately that sort of the same thing, like I said, with, with the freemium businesses that if, if they can be successful with 90 something percent of their users not paying anything, is that a, a negative or is that an opportunity? They have 90 something percent of the people who haven't yet paid them something that they can sell something to. Any, any other questions? Social graph was the word I was looking for. Uh, so one thing that stands out to me when I think about kind of the way you presented this is that it, it seems to fit in my mind mostly for more consumer web products where you're getting a lot of users coming through the door, many of whom are anonymous. I'm wondering how you would translate some of these concepts into something more of a B2B or almost towards an enterprise type sales process where it's not anonymous and it's a much lower quantity of users. Do uh, you mean in the network effect side or the other side? The other side. Um, I think a lot of the influence for me has been Four Steps to the Epiphany that is based on primarily business to business experience. And then the, the general idea of you have to create a product of value, you then figure out how to efficiently get it in the hands of people. So you don't want to scale a giant sales team getting it in people's hands when you haven't figured out how to create value for, for users yet. I mean, I think these translate really well in, in the normal business. The network effect business, like, I, I don't know very many examples of network effect businesses that are business to business. So, um, but there's some. I mean, I think Skype would be a one that's, like a lot of these kind of play in that space. But so, even Zobni and Dropbox and LogMeIn, like those all have a lot of business customers on them. And, um, and it, it's definitely applicable for those businesses. So, that's one quick follow-up on sure. that. If if in that type of situation, you have a B2B type sale, and your, your customer is a business as opposed to just a consumer, um, how would you go about measuring product market fit and the satisfaction in the same way with sort of the survey.io, or would you kind of approach that differently? Uh, there's definitely people who have concerns about asking a business customer if you would be very disappointed if you could no longer use this, that it might send the wrong <laughs> signal. Um, but ultimately, if you just say, do you consider this a must-have, and you find a new line, like that would work too. It's just basically about essentially setting a benchmark with something. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that you, the reason that I actually first started using the very disappointed question with Zobni, and that was because of the managers that were on there, when I said, how satisfied are you with this product? Managers are never satisfied. They were always somewhat satisfied. But as soon as I said, how disappointed would you be if you could no longer use this product? I'd be very disappointed, God damn it. So I think in that case, it worked well for, for businesses. <laughs> yeah? So, so if you've got a Zomini kind of product where you have a large user base which is free and maybe ad supported, and then you've got the smaller user base which pays a lot of money business users, um, what do you ask them upfront at the time of sign up? Like which type of user they are so that you can customize the experience through the product and maybe offer the business people 30 days ad free or something? Um, if, you, if you look at the log me in sign up process, there's, there's a, a very clear distinction. In, in that case, it's between are you using it to support other people's PCs or access your own PC? But a branching registration is a great way to do that so that you can uh, introduce the right premium product to people. Okay. That last one. Uh, Make it good. Since we're on Log Me In, how did you decide on your guys' approach from once you had a product, once you had a workable product, how did you guys decide on customer acquisition? Was it did you go after those CNET reviews, trying to get visibility that way, or was it? And the way that I, I do it with all businesses, it's always better for me to generically speak, okay. and then you can apply it. But the way I do it for all businesses is that I start with. Uh, people who are in the market already, is there is there active intent for that product? It's a lot easier to sell into active intent than trying to create demand for a product. And it really works well if you've got a free product and someone else has a premium product and they're spending tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars promoting that premium product. And then you can follow in with a value proposition that is so much better that you can really just draft off of the demand that someone else is creating. But it's not funny because I do IT consulting and when LogMeIn popped up, I ran around to every office that I do IT from. I'm like, get rid of that. This is where you go. Uh -huh. And it was immediately once people used it, it was 
Yeah. yeah but I mean, that's what it, you have to you have to start with a great experience, and then all these things. So to me, I didn't even understand the importance of a great experience until like the fifth startup I worked with, or the sixth startup I worked with was one that seven percent of users said they'd be very disappointed without it, and so. My first several startups was just the luck of actually having something that had product market fit from day one. Like, ah, I'm a genius. Look, I just touch them and they get successful. But then as soon as I try to do that to another company that doesn't have it, it's like, oh, wow. Like, I maybe should be giving the engineers and product guys a little more credit. <laughs> so. All right. Thanks.